So good evening. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and I'm pleased to welcome you this evening to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives for tonight's program, Historians on Hamilton, How a Blockbuster Musical is Restaging America's Past. I'm glad to see so many of you here on a miserable night, and I want to extend a special welcome to those of you who are joining us on our YouTube station. Before we hear from tonight's panelists, I'd like to tell you about two other programs coming up here next month. On Thursday, October 11th at 7 p.m., in a program to celebrate NASA's 60th anniversary, Rory Kennedy will introduce her new documentary film, Above and Beyond, NASA's Journey to Tomorrow. The film presents the agency's many accomplishments in space and the vital role NASA has played in measuring the health of our planet. A week later, on Thursday, October 18th at 7 p.m., we'll celebrate the bicentennial of the birth of Frederick Douglass with a panel discussion on Frederick Douglass, 19th century civil rights activist, his legacy today. The panel will explore Douglass's legacy as well as contemporary issues related to his causes. Check our website at archives.gov to sign up or sign up at the table outside the theater to get email updates. You'll also find information about other National Archives programs and activities. And another way to become more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports the work of the agency, especially our education and outreach activities. And there are applications for membership on the archivesfoundation.org website. When the musical Hamilton came to the Kennedy Center this summer, Washington, D.C. caught the fever and that had been spreading through fans since the show opened in New York in 2015. Here at the National Archives, we mounted a special display of Hamilton documents from our holdings as a tie-in to the show. Our curator paired lyrics with five original documents that inspired them, a Revolutionary War report to Lafayette, a plan of government, Washington's nomination of Hamilton as Secretary of the Treasury, Hamilton's statement of property and debts, and a petition from Eliza Hamilton asking Congress to publish her husband's papers. Eliza's foresight means that two centuries later, we have direct access to Alexander's thoughts and ideas recorded in his own words. Founders Online, a website hosted by the National Archives and funded by our National Historical Publications and Records Commission, has transcriptions of thousands of documents written by and to the nation's founders. The Hamilton Papers alone amount to more than 15,000 documents. Because of these, do these documents were preserved and published, Ron Chernow was able to draw on them for his biography, Hamilton, and Lynn manuel Miranda could let the authentic voice of Hamilton speak in his lyrics. When Chernow Miranda and director Tommy Kale received the National Archives Foundation Records of Achievement Award in 2016, all three emphasized the importance of the Hamilton, of ha having access to Hamilton's actual words. The remarkable, res remarkable response to the musical has led to more visibility for Alexander Hamilton than ever before. So let's bring our panelists to start the discussion. Our moderator this evening is Nelson Presley, theater correct collect correspondent for the Washington Post. Joining him are Renee Romano, the Robert S. Danforth Professor of History at Oberlin, Joseph Edelman, Assistant Professor of History at Framingham University, Claire Bon Potter, Professor of History and Executive Editor of Public Seminar at the New School in New York, Brian Herrera, Assistant Professor of Theater at the Lewis Center for the Arts at Princeton, and Mike O'Malley, Professor of History at George Mason University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panelists. Good evening. Good to see you all on a skunky weather night. Uh, I'm Nelson Presley. I'm going to introduce the panel so you know who is who as we go. This is Claire Bond Potter, and to her right, Renee Romano, Michael O'Malley, Brian Herrera, Joseph Edelman. And I think to set the mood, we have a video clip. Is that right? Can we roll it? Just watching. You cast patiently wait in the 
passion and dispassion, every expectation, every action, and not the creation. I'm laughing in the face of casualties of sorrow. Every time I'm thinking past tomorrow, I'm not enough for me, my shot. I'm not for me, my shot. <laughs> Exciting, isn't it? Oh, the, the lights went all the way down. I was going to ask you all, just as, as a point of reference, thanks, just, just to get us started, um, Hamilton has been a really tight ticket everywhere for three years, <laughs> and yet some people are getting in, some people are seeing it. So just so we know roughly where we stand, if you've seen the show, oh, look at this. Right. Look at this. Okay. <laughs> That's great. That's, um, that's great. Um, I wanted to ask the panel just an, an opening question. Um, if you could describe your first encounter with the musical, and what was your response? Were you thrilled? Were you appalled? <laughs> was it, or, or was it somewhere in between? And, and let's go ahead and start with you, Claire, and just go straight down the line. Well, my first encounter with the musical was when Renee called and said, <laughs> we need to do a book. This is the best thing that's happening. It's so exciting. And I actually went onto YouTube and got the free version and sort of listened around. And I was like, I don't really know about this. I'm not really feeling it. And I called Renee back. And she's like, no, no, no. You have to listen to it. So I got into the car. I had to drive to New York. And I listened to it all the way through. And by the time I was driving down the West Side Highway, I just had tears pouring down my face. And it was really, I have, I have not been so overwhelmed by um, by music in a very long time. And so I got home and called Renee and I said, okay, you're right. As always, um, we need to do the book. So I guess my first encounter was my spouse was listening to it and he said, you have to listen to this. And I said, well, I don't actually, no offense, Joseph, um, I'm not a huge fan of early American history. Like, it's not my field. <laughs> I, you know, like, oh, but, like, you know, something about Alexander Hamilton. Didn't he start a bank? Like, I don't know. Um, it's, uh, so, but he's like, no, really, you'd like it. So, okay, I'll try it. And then, uh, like Claire, I, you know, put in my earphones, and I went for a walk, and then I just kept walking. So I'm like, I, now, I didn't realize the first time I listened to it that it was his entire life story. Like, it told the span of his life. Mm -hmm. And by the end, I just thought, this is the most, um, it's emotionally moving, it's really entertaining, it's really informative. I learned things I didn't know, but also I loved the way it was put together. So just, it was so beautifully structured. And so I left that moment thinking just, not at that point that uh, let's do a book, but certainly at that point I'm going to listen to this over and over again for uh, you know the next four months, which I did. Mm -hmm. I guess my first exposure was my daughter and her friends, uh, 12 to 14. All the neighborhood girls would come over her house, and they all knew. Like my daughters memorized Cabinet Battle Number Two, and my house was <laughs> full of 12 and 13 white girls from the suburbs pretending to be black guys pretending to be Alexander Hamilton. It was a very <laughs> interesting moment. <laughs> Um, my, my first encounter with Hamilton came in a slightly different uh, route. I was, uh, I was literally at my working space and working on, a, on an essay I was really struggling with about Lin-Manuel Miranda's In the Heights. And I got an email as I was sort of struggling with Miranda, Miranda's earliest and sort of uh, path, like his first sort of career marker musical. I got this email from the public theater where I'm, I'm a member and it said, oh, Lynn Monroe Miranda's got this new show coming up. We, today is the day that early tickets go on sale. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm working on the guy. I should probably get a ticket. And so I go on and I can't quite, I, I'm clicking it, I'm clicking it, and the website's not working. And I'm like, what's going on? That's weird. And so I, luckily, an hour or two later, I was, I guess, avoiding my essay, and I looked at my email again, and I clicked it, and I went on, and I said, oh, I'll go that night. And it was almost sold out. And I was like, oh, I guess I better get tickets. So I got tickets, and still not really knowing what it was. And then I got this fellowship that took me away from New, New Jersey, where I live, and I was going to be in Texas for the year. And I was like, oh, well, I guess I won't be able to use those Hamilton tickets. I'll give them to one of my colleagues. 
as the year went along, I was like, oh, this Hamilton seems like it's this buzz going on. <laughs> and so I actually arranged it so I was brought back to do an event. And I said, I'll come back if you can do it on these dates so I can go use my <laughs> Hamilton ticket. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, my partner, he, I said, you want to go to this thing? And he was like, what is it? <laughs> Like a rap musical, and I, said, I, 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 I don't know. And, I, and then luckily, I was able to say, well, it is sort of a hot ticket. And that was enough. He was like, I'm in. I'm going. And so we went. And it turned out we were going. I selected the ticket because I knew there was going to be a conversation after the performance. It turns out we went on the night, the final night of previews, the night that they finally froze the show for the first run at, at the public. And after this, after the, afterwards, the whole cast got on stage with Ron Chernow to talk about it, but it was the moment in the process of the first production, the public production, where they would have been changing things up until the performance I saw. And that was the last night. And then starting that, they would run the same show up through the rest of the public run. So, so as an early Americanist, it seemed like the most natural thing in the world to do a musical about the Revolutionary <laughs> Republic. I don't know what everyone else on, on stage is saying. Um, I, you know, if we did the musical about the War of Jenkins here, I'd watch it. Um, I go back, I don't know how many of you know about the YouTube clip of Lin-Manuel Miranda at the White House in 2009 at the Spoken Word. So I go back to that as my first exposure to the musical, and it's, I didn't know about In the Heights, so it's, who is this guy? And, but he's, it, it's this crazy thing, but you watch the video and it's like, oh, yeah, this might work. Um, so of course I started showing it to my students when we got to that point in the semester and talking about the early republic and play the clip and then saying, oh, by the way, he's making a musical. And they look at me roughly like it sounds. The four of you look like, he's, do he's doing what? He's going to write a musical about what? Um, but that's, I mean, I followed the news sort of obsessively. Um, I got to see the show um, based on a, with a group of historians who got organized on Twitter as a group to go see the show. Um, thank God for social media um, that I got to go see the show with the original cast. And as soon as the cast album came out, I bought it and listened to the, for me, listening to the cast album was a long drive back from a conference. And then my kids started listening to it. And now they've memorized most of it. There are a few songs they're not allowed to listen to. But they've memorized it. And it's just, it's a family thing now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, all enthusiasm is what it sounds like. No, no real nagging. No, not, nothing really clawing at you on first encounter? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I think one of the things I was struck by was you notice, even if you're not an early Americanist, you notice the things that are elided, that have been, you know, the characters that have been sort of put together and so on and so forth. So, so I think a lot of historians, um, to, to some degree or another, um, ask questions about accuracy. And I think, and, and Joseph can probably speak to this better, for, for the people who are real early Americanists, they're far more invested in that than, than the rest of us. I found that there were themes in the show that evoked truths about American history that were not necessarily factual. You mm -hmm. know, for example, the presentation of King George as the only gay character in the play, right? <laughs> you know, whereas we actually have John Lawrence, who probably was gay, right? But, but here we have King George as the only gay character in the play. Well, why is that real? It's real because one of the ways of mocking King George was to talk about him as effeminate, right? So, so it's something that, that Miranda learned about early American political culture that became part of the character that is in fact true, even though King George wasn't gay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I ahead, was, was um, still bothered by, well, it's, you know, it's okay, it's a great piece of art. I'm gonna go with that, like that's clear. But um, it's what in history, you probably know this if you're studying history, it's sort of a great man history. Yeah. Turnhouse biography is yeah. an excellent biography, but it's a great man history, which then the, the claim of great man history is that history is made by great men, like notable great men. That's what it is. An alternative way would be to say history is made by ordinary people. The stuff of their lives is history, too. There's an alternative way, and it's very much a great man history. And then it's particularly odd to have a great man history, a great white man history, in which the cast is not white. And you come away with the message. You see a group of non-white people extolling the virtue of a great white man. And that nagged at me the first time I saw it, and it still nags at me. I don't know quite what I think about it. But I think there could have been a lot of ways to tell a different story, it wouldn't have been the same story. 
I think sometimes that it's, a lot of its success has to do with the fundamental conservatism of that stance. It's a great man history, and it's a great man history in which black people tell us that this particular white man was really great. Except I see that a little differently in the sense that, yes, I agree that there's a fundamental conservatism to the story and the kind of celebration of America we see there. It's really extolling this kind of very traditional American story of self-made men who can go on and accomplish great things and the nation is a place of possibility, right? But the telling of it by an, you know, a, a cast of color, to me, uh, is doing different political work than yeah. that suggests, in my mind at least. I think that's really doing a, an interesting political work where it is saying this is a country where you know, the 1790 naturalization law said only free white persons can naturalize. Right? This is a country where there has long been a link between full citizenship and whiteness. How do you decouple that link? What are the ways that you can expand the circle of who is a considered and gets to belong and gets to be a rightful owner of the nation's history? And so by putting people of color as the, the, the founders here, making them the, the narrators of this origin story, I think it's doing a really interesting intervention to say we need to, as a country, expand who is fully included in our country as, as full and equal citizens. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that my, my um, your question about how to, do we come out fans, I, can't, I, I think my experience of Hamilton is not atypical, uh, you know, necessarily, because I, um, I found it theatrically thrilling. I found it really exciting as a theatrical, as a theatrical, I was, found it very exciting and fascinating and interesting, and I was very, my, my pace quickened, my mood elevated. I had all kinds of sensations and feelings and experiences, but I ended up not really having an emotional connect. I ended up not really connecting emotionally to the story. And so that permitted me, I think, almost immediately to be thinking a little bit more about like what's at work here? Why are they doing this? And indeed, I came at it not as I'm a theater historian and a historian of performance in my area of specialization is not only the history of race and ethnicity in 20th century and earlier US popular entertainment, but I'm writing a book about casting. So of course, this project opened up all kinds of interesting things for me. And so what I saw in this first show when I saw it was I said, this was a show that was clearly intended to be an influential success. And as I write in the book, it never really, I don't think anybody planned for it to be the blockbuster global phenomenon, but it was designed to make an intervention in the way that race and heroism were imaginable on the stage, and especially in the architecture of American theatrical. And in some ways, I think he was writing toward broad, possibly Broadway, but definitely toward school productions, you know, those kind of things. And then you can see it in the show. The show is written in ways to be supported by a particular kind of contract with doubling of characters and all those kind of things. Like it was written to be supported by a regional not-for-profit level development contract. And then it exploded, and that just became fortified in how the cast is built, you know. But if it had... So there were certain things about it that I thought was built with very particular intentions. It wanted to put people of color in this, at, the, at the center of the story and not at the margins. And one way to do that was think about the, the core of an American story. And indeed, the genealogy of why this American story is other American stories is, is part of the lore. But I did see it. I had, I had, um, I had a very sort of two-track response mm -hmm. all, all, all the way along. Right. Um, this kind of cracks open the door. We'll continue to pry it open. Um, there's a little further mood setter. There's a PowerPoint. I think I was going to have a clicker, but I don't. Is there a way to sort of <laughs> scroll through the PowerPoint? And if you guys could sort of look at it, or you can see it here. Um, we don't have anything prepared with the PowerPoint, but we can free associate. If there's, if there's an image that you see that triggers something, right. um, then let, let's, this is our man, Alexander right. Hamilton. Triggers for me your essay like, on money and the yeah, image of Hamilton. The, the, yeah, image, right, yeah. the money image and how that oh, uh, changes over time. Right? It, it, it's, it's a big leap to make Hamilton a, a sort of a hero of the ordinary man since a lot of his yeah. operations as a, the money manager are about empowering elites and kind of mm -hmm. disempowering yeah. and controlling credit. They, I mean, it's, I, I, you can, historians will always quibble. You, part of the pleasure of being an academic <laughs> is telling other people that the things they like are not good. That's part of the pleasure. <laughs> the pleasure of the job. Your children so will never want to see a movie right, with me. you if you're an academic because um, you always ruin it, right? I mean, <laughs> he, does, he does come from nothing, right? He comes from very little. But it's, a lot of his actions are very strongly about making sure that elites get paid first. And yep. if anybody else gets paid, it's way down the line. And that's why he's on a lot of the money early on because he symbolizes a strong central bank and a strong federal state. And people who are opposed to that can't wait to get him off the money. It's a very interesting. <laughs> <laughs>
And that's the original cast, is it not? Strong yep. right Yeah, that's original yeah. cast. Yeah. Right. Um, is there anything particularly powerful about that image? Well, I think one of the things that's very powerful about it is something that the revolutionary world did not do, which is put women at the center. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that so that there are several um, numbers in which the women have agency. The women are making choices. The women are, you know, the, the first scene with the Schuyler sisters, um, they're looking for the revolution and they're looking for a man at work or a mind at work. Um, and that's a kind of, that is as much a fantasy about early America as the idea that black and Hispanic people could be the founding fathers. And I think that's another, fantasy that the, that the show promotes, what would it look like if women had had agency um, during the revolution? What would it have looked like if somebody had paid attention to the idea of women actually voting um, or of women, you know, organizing um, their own marriages skillfully? And I think, you know, <laughs> Catherine, <laughs> Catherine Algor in, in our book writes an essay about curvature and talks about the real world um, that early American women lived in. Um, I mean, for example, people like the Schuyler sisters would not have been walking around downtown where Hamilton and his friends mm -hmm. were hanging out all by themselves because it, it would have been unthinkable. Um, so, so I think that kind of a scene puts um, a fantasy about women's lives sort of front and center to allow us to think about it today. You know, what is unthinkable for women today and what would it look like to restage that um, and give women power and agency. Mm -hmm. I will say that one th that if we're thinking about gender, and one of the things when I look at this image or images like it, I do think about gender. And one of the things I think about is um, the way in which, for all of our conversation, and indeed, you know, Claire's conversation about the named female characters in this show, in some ways, doesn't always acknowledge the kinds of female agency we see on the stage in performance. And indeed, if you look at this lineup, you see right now that the, that the ensemble members mm -hmm. are alternating with one step slightly behind. So, each, so you see the women in the dresses. The easiest way to see it is to look to see the ensemble members that are stepping just one step behind the women in the dresses. You'll notice that those costumes are remarkably uniform given that the bodies are uh, across gender spectrum. They're sleeveless, they got the same neutral thing, they have sort of typically a waistcoat kind of thing, some kind of boots that are almost like, uh, like boots that are, and so there's a consistent costuming because one of the things that I'm fascinated about the musical is the way that it uses a kind of a, gender fluidity in the ensemble, where the women are taking on, the women in the ensemble who there's no, no, no ignoring the fact that they're women, they're not always wearing skirts. They're sometimes wearing the, the body, they're sometimes a bullet. They're sometimes wearing uh, the garments of war. And so I think that there's, what I think is so interesting about the musical is there's the narrative thread, but then there's also the apparatus that is always playing with fluidity of where are we seeing action? Who are we seeing taking action? And one of the ways that we see people take action are outside of named characters because the ensemble's choreography and vocality is so central to the piece. So for me, when I see this, I see the very deft staging of here are the characters whose names we know and look at all these people of this early American moment whose names we don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> he stole the show. He, did, he, just, he walks out, when he was in the show on Broadway, and he walks out in that purple velvet suit. Right. David Diggs. David yeah. Diggs. Right. And just owns the stage as Jefferson and yeah. debonair. Um, it's it's not the suit though. I saw the show twice, once with him and once without, and the, the whole feeling of the show changed. And when Davy Diggs was the was Jefferson, it felt much more like he was an equal partner to Hamilton in the show. Mm. Like it was sort of their their story, these two men. And in the other production I saw, it was not like it, you know he was good, right? But he didn't command the stage in that way. One of the things that I think this image brings to me, and this has been. Um, you know, some of the, and you could probably talk to this more, Joe, than I could, but the ways in which um, certain founding fathers have particular stock at certain times, like right? their, their credibility, their reputation goes up and down, depending often you know, on contemporary political concerns, right? So who is the popular guy now? And right now, Jefferson, Jefferson is in the doghouse, right? <laughs> yeah. Like Jefferson's stock is really, really low right now. 
50 years ago, he was. Yeah, 50 years ago, he was the guy, right? Right now, he's down here, and it's because of his connection to slavery, right? It's because of these things that, you know, one of the things this musical does, which is not, um, also, it elides the centrality of slavery to, uh, to early America, and also slavery in New York. It makes Hamilton much more anti slavery than he actually was, right? But one of the things this show is doing, it's saying we are celebrating those founding fathers who we could uh, like say were against slavery or at least were like ashamed of sort it, right? Of, yes. So at the end, yeah. you know, George Washington sort of bows his head when they're talking about slavery, like I'm kind of ashamed. And we are making fun of those founding fathers who we can't make those same claims about, mm -hmm. right? So he, it's really a, a time where Jefferson's his, reputation is in tatters his, at the moment. His <laughs> stock is down in this. I think this is the tableau at the end of What Did I Miss, which is the number mm -hmm. with the only reference to an enslaved person, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where Jefferson has this sort of throw-off line to Sally be a lamb, darling, won't you open the letter that he got from Washington. And I was there with a group of historians, and you could hear 20 people go <laughs> <laughs> in sync when that line <laughs> came out of David Diggs' mouth, because it's, right. it's the silence in a way that yeah. speaks a lot of what is, that one reference sort of points out that a lot of what's missing. Mm -hmm. Um, and Lyra Montero, who wrote in the volume, talks about the room where it happened, that that number, the room where it happened, there are only three men in the room, except there were others. There were enslaved people, right. as, as she points out and, and talks mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. who were in that room listening to that conversation, serving dinner, just mm -hmm. at a minimum. Although I would say, and this is sort of a, a shout out to our dear departed colleague, Jan Lewis. Um, Jan Lewis wrote a wonderful piece about Jefferson's two families. And one of the things she writes about is the ways in which visitors to, the Jeff to Monticello knew that those slaves standing around the dinner table were Jefferson's children. They could see it on their faces, and no one ever talked about it. So there, there is some level, and I hope I'm not making excuses for Miranda here, in which Jefferson's sort of casual allusion to Sally Hemings, again, it evokes a kind of reality for me of the, the presence of slaves and the failure to acknowledge their presence as, as human beings on a certain level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would, um, oh gosh, I just lost my train of thought, but I would, <laughs> You got to come back to something. Well, like, come back. Go ahead. Thank you, Mike. I just can't get past it when I look at. I'm like thinking, <laughs> Jeff, you know, he, he, there's something interesting about it because uh, accounts of the Jefferson of Monticello would often talk about his brother. You know, Randolph would be down in the in the quarter playing the violin, and there's something about um, the attraction of African American culture and African American people that Jefferson embodies to modern viewers, right. which the he sort of gets to, but doesn't, is afraid to get to, I feel like. I mean, I take your point, Ray. It's a good one. I mean, well, I, I don't I mean, agree with it. <laughs> that is absolutely fair. I yeah. got the point back. The, the thing I want to say is that one of the ways in which, I think part of the reason I'm in the book is because I was an early Americanist who was willing to defend the show. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the early um, Americanists one of the, are Well, so one of the critiques that, um, I don't want to say irked, but that I didn't think was necessarily the fairest, is that this is a show about, to defend Miranda here a little bit, it's a show about Hamilton, right? It's called Hamilton. It's not called Hamilton and Jefferson. It's not called Hamilton and Burr. It's not Hamilton and these other, it's not called the founding brothers. Um, it's, right, it's, it's Hamilton. And so dealing with Jefferson's relationship to slavery is to a certain extent outside of the purview of what he's taken on in the musical. Mm -hmm. And as a historian, that, that bothers us because we want to say, but that is important. Central. Central. Yeah. But he's an artist telling a story about yes. Hamilton, and he's, but, yeah, he's, in two hours, yeah. 45 minutes, he's already using twice as many words as are in any other musical. And I think that, that, that one of the things that I always go back to in terms of the, drama, the dramatic or the dramaturgical structure of the piece is the way that early on in the show, um, there's that key moment where we see there are, two, there are multiple sides to every story. It's always about a blue, oblique viewership. Like this, Burr is talking about the room where it happens. Mm -hmm. Angelica and Eliza sort of tell the same story from two different points of view. And so I do think that there is in this sort of, and I'm fascinated by the line, just like immigrants would get the job done, uh, Sally, Sally Darling be a lamb. These are certain lines that have ended up becoming interesting touchstones in conversation about the piece because they're, they don't close anything down. In fact, they open other things up. Yep. And so in some ways that Sally line, yep. as glib as it is, and I'm not gonna say it's not glib, um, and might be written in a different way at this, his, this moment if he was writing the music now, like, um, but there is a way in which it's not 
trying to pin it, it's opening it in ways that I see the energy attracted to it. And there's a couple other lines in the show, but the two that have gotten the most commentary are Sally and Immigrants Will Get the Job Done. Um, but these are ones that are like sort of, here we are, let's just sort of name a paradox and then the show moves on like the train it is. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's right. And also, like, Jefferson, can't you open your own damn letter? You know, I mean, that actually does say something <laughs> yeah. about, dress like that. about what <laughs> slavery was, which is, you know, enslaved people doing intimate things that that in modern day we imagine right. people doing for themselves but Jefferson was this kind of um, you know faux European lord um, right. of his own castle so I mean you can sort of work on these forever but I think Brian's right you turn it around and see what it opens up for you about right. this world although I would say like for me it's not so much the Jefferson's relationship to slavery as what I would critique the play for in terms of its its uh, coverage of slavery, it's, it's the way in which it makes slavery something that's only in the South, right? right. So it gets Absolutely. talked about as this is a Southern thing and it's all those Southerners. When, you know, when Hamilton was in New York, what, 40% of the New York population was enslaved people, right? So it was not just a Southern <coughs> phenomena, but the play really reinforces what is a very common misrepresentation uh, of slavery in America that was only in the South. Right. And I think that's more of a, a, a you know, I would, put more of a challenge on that show is it's yelling, you know, saying New York, great city in the world, right, without acknowledging New York's own history. And, and even to the slavery. extent that people were not enslaved, a lot of New York's commerce of, of Newport, of Boston, right. is involved in this, mm -hmm. involved either directly or indirectly in the slave trade. I'm gonna scroll through a couple of these um, <laughs> photos right quick and ask, ask you why you think so many people find this representation of history so thrilling because thrilling was a word that, that kind of got out there early and I think mm -hmm. is, is not disputed a heck of a lot. I also want to mention, we'll open up um, for, for your questions in, in a bit. So if you've got something, <laughs> please compose your thoughts. Um, um, Oath of Allegiance, Valley Forge, this is... I've always loved this image. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Such energy. Yeah, yeah. and it's, so it's, it's very, I mean, it's this, it's mm -hmm. this minute. And the women, as you, as, as you spoke to. Yeah. And Peggy. Uh, George Washington nominated Alexander Hamilton Secretary for the Department of Treasury, September 11th, 1789. That's a wild move. <laughs> this is uh, Leslie Odom Jr., Aaron Burr. Do we know exactly which moment this is? Uh, is this I think that's in the room. Is this way for it? Uh, no? No, because no. no, he's already dressed as Jefferson. It's the room where it happens. Oh, yeah. it's the room where it happens. Okay. Not that I've seen the show or right. listened to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's an earlier moment. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Everybody sing the song. <laughs> yeah, that one we could sing. Yeah. yeah. That was my kid's entry point because it was the only one they knew the words to at first. Right. Really? Da 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 da. <laughs> and then that's maybe we'll just leave yeah. it there for a second that's Lafayette is, is, is this not yeah. Lafayette yes. yeah that's yes. Lafayette yeah and so then again to go to the question of and I don't know maybe it's maybe it's maybe it's obvious but I'd, I'd be interested from your perspective why is why is it that you think so many people because we are talking about so many people right. and this is this is like an unprecedented theatrical mm -hmm. um, phenomenon find it thrilling yeah well <laughs> um, not to toot the horn of our own profession, but <laughs> I it think happens so often. It happens so often. Yeah, no, we don't right. need more tooting. Right. Seriously, and Historian this is something I talk about in, in my own mm -hmm. chapter, which is about the, the use of social media to promote right. Hamilton. I think people love history. I think people genuinely love history. If you look at, you know, I, I, Hamilton is obviously a mega phenomena. Um, but one of the things that it triggered was a kind of awareness of all of the historical resources that are all around us, right? So, you know, people started coming to New York and going to the Trinity Church where, where Hamilton was buried. They would go over to Weehawken to look at the, at the dueling ground, which is, you know, just this sort of trashy place right now. Um, they would... They would, start, they would read the Federalist Papers. I mean, one of the things that was fascinating to me is when we decided to do this project, I thought, 
I really have to read the Federalist Papers again. I haven't read them since I was in high school. And I went on Amazon to buy them, and they were sold out. <laughs> and, you know, and who knows? <laughs> And it was That's like people funny. were giving the Federalist Papers four stars. And, you know. I couldn't put it down. And it's sort of like you think, well, you know. Checks and balances. Hey, yeah. you know, at the moment we were doing this, you know, we were in the middle of the 2016 wow. election. Everybody was unhappy and upset all the time. And you could see, actually, maybe there's something in what we do for a living that is really helping people. Mm. That, right. that, you know, is sort of throwing people back on thinking about the, the sort of earliest principles and contradictions and flaws of this country. Mm -hmm. And I guess I would add to that the, the ways in which Hamilton is a hero, but he's deeply flawed in this play. I mean, I would say that probably the most moving moment of the, my first listen through was when Hamilton and Eliza have to deal with the Reynolds affair. Mm -hmm. And that is a kind of universal moment um, in the lives of people who love each other, um, where one person has hurt each other, someone else terribly, um, and both. It's a historical story, but it's also asking the audience to say, you know, this is how historians think. They look at the evidence, but then there's a sort of central strand of humanness, that, and, and we try to tell that story, and we try and tell it successfully to you. So, so I actually think it's Americans love for history. Mm. I know that sounds corny, but well, I think Well, but I would, I, would, I would say, though, there's something about the way this history is being told that yeah. makes it so popular because, honestly, you know, we may love history, but we don't all love history like we're going to go see a play about Alexander Hamilton unless it's being told in a way that really brings these characters to life but also makes... I think what this play does so very, very well is it, and, and what, what Miranda has done so well here, is he has used things from, he's written history in the vernacular. So you take a duel, how do you understand the honor culture that was you know, somewhat foreign to us yeah. now? Like why would two guys go kill each other, or try to kill each other because one you know, said, you know, I think you're a cur, right? Except they do it in Chicago all the time. Well, this you is know? what, right? I mean, uh, well, no, this I'm is the thing, serious. right? No, I'm, this is, he's taking then you know, the, the music, right, to understand the dueling. He's taking modern day yeah. moments where we see an honor culture working yep. and using it to tell that moment or like when you get um, the, all the rap battles right I think it's brilliant like early American politics were really contentious right there were guys yelling at each other in Congress there were you know it was not like people were staid and polite to each other like they are today, like today. exactly <laughs> right we're so, we've come so far but, we've but come I so think, far but I think that I think that yeah. one of the things that I would conc I would agree with Renee I think a little bit on this is I think the history piece is part of the appeal but I do think that there is something very artful in the way that mm -hmm. Miranda is able to sort of there's something familiar for everybody and something a new uh, something to learn and to discover and to get better at by the end mm -hmm. so for a lot of folks of a certain generation you might have a glancing sense of the history and the show is built in a very traditional musical theatrical idiom and it actually uses musical theatrical idiom in a very conventional way it also then adds sort of the stylistic flourishes of late 90s hip-hop in very particular ways too so even if you've not had a lot of rap in your ears, it lets you practice the particular rhythmics, the way that the rhyme schemes works a little bit different than they do in traditional music. It lets you learn something as you go, at the same time giving you something that's familiar enough. Um, I also think that there, I mean, I think part of the reason it's a big success is because it has something, I, I long joked before Hamilton came along, I said, every producer is looking for the next blockbuster, and the art is how to appeal to a 13-year-old girl and her dad. <laughs> because the dad has to buy the ticket, but the passion driving everyone to the theater in a group of five to six is going to be the 13-year-old girl. And that could be a 13-year-old girl who lives in a body like mine. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, the 13-year-old girl who lives in the soul. Um, uh, so, but it's, that, it's speaking to that thrilled fangirl at the same time speaking to this is a worthy enough to plunk down the change and right. go to the hassle of going to the theater. And this was a perfect meld, because this was a sort of a dad biography, a dad Christmas biography kind of book. And then it sort of was mailed with this sort of superstar kind of exhilaration of the artistry of the performance. So I think it's, it's the duality. It's the mm -hmm. fact that he's speaking multiple languages simultaneously, and we can tune into one frequency, and that helps us hear the other. 
Joseph, I think you were going to say, and then I've got a question for Brian. I just had a couple of the Federalist Papers, but we're way past it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I'm going to be the crowd here and say, like, I, it's very, the issue with historical films, for example, is notoriously that they're always the present in costume, and they're always about present concerns, and mm -hmm. they're always about present mentalities, right? So we can have the women doing things they could not do in their day, and that I can't, I'm enough of a crank, I guess, as a conservative, that I can't get past that. It's very frustrating. It could be well, curmudgeon. Yeah, curmudgeon yeah. works too, yeah. <laughs> well, but my, my daughter loved it but yeah, when she's 13, but I didn't. And that's yeah. partly because I can't, I think maybe history isn't fictionalized easy. It's somewhat dry, and it involves the radical and somewhat frightening alterity of the past, which is not like the present, yeah. Yeah. doesn't speak to you in a familiar language, and doesn't easily render itself in modern terms. That struggle is really an important part of doing history or being a historian. And I get uneasy about the erasure of that struggle. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that bugs me about it. Like, so what? Okay, fine, it bugs me about it. But if I had to criticize, it would be for that. And that would be something you could apply to most historical films, too. But wouldn't you also well, say, Michael, that, that part of what both the soundtrack, which is what most people have experienced, yeah. you know, most people haven't I seen say, it. I never saw it. I've yeah. only ever heard the soundtrack. So I'm, 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 really, not, I'm so, really not qualified to. Sorry. But, but sorry. the soundtrack. Oh, the cast album. So I'm not being corrected. It's the, the cast right album, position. my dear. Right. Cast right. recording. The, the cast the album cast and the, the, um, the Hamilton and everything. That, that people can come in wherever they are. Yeah. That, you know, and, and that that's part of what's seductive about it. So the 13 year old girl and the dad are watching it and listening to it for At entirely different, levels, different yeah. reasons and enjoying it possibly for different reasons too. <laughs> yeah. You know? Right. And he also Just, is, he's much more, I think one of the things that does work as opposed to historical films, the Patriot. Um, yeah, that, is that he's very, but he's very it. transparent about ripping it out of context, yeah. right? It, it yes. works to do right. what he's doing because he's so honestly and transparently and earnestly saying, I am telling you this, right? It's the, the tagline, a couple of you mentioned it, it in your essays, story. the story of America then by America now, right? He's very clearly ripping yeah. it out of context in a way, I mean, I think I like 1776 as a musical, but it, it's much more in the vein of trying to represent. And it is very 1968. And it is very 1968. <laughs> um, and the, I mean, the only thing I would say about it is that, you know, ripping out of the context, the only thing he couldn't do was he couldn't find any way to make John Adams rap. Yeah. <laughs> Just that was, that's a bridge too far. <laughs> Hamilton, Jefferson, Washington, a lot of them. Adams, no. Right. Yeah. But Joseph, didn't you, I think you wrote that um, it's an exemplary people's history, the musical. Can you explain that? Yeah, uh, so what I mean by that in, in my essay is that um, he is, Miranda, is part of a long tradition of popularizing historians that goes back to the founding era. And in my essay, I'm going to apologize in advance if I ruin anyone's childhood, um, goes all the way back to the founding era and Mason Locke Weems, Parson Weems, um, who published an enormously popular biography of George Washington that came out within weeks or months in its first edition after uh, Washington's death. Um, and in that is the story of the cherry tree, right, which we all know because we've all heard about it, that George's father is, notices on the plantation that a cherry tree has been chopped down, that he, it's his favorite cherry tree. Who did this? And little six-year-old George comes running up, and what does he say? <laughs> yeah, you know who's lying? <laughs> Weems. <laughs> Weems. He made up. He makes up the story completely out of whole cloth. Not a shred of truth. Not a shred of truth. Uh, I mean, he claims in 1800 to have talked to George Washington's teacher from the 1730s. Right. Sure he did. That yes, have, um, right. But that the point of that story and the story that immediately follows it is a story about George and his father walking through a garden and finding a cabbage patch that spells out the word George and. No, his right. father tells yeah. Speaking, his yeah. father tells him that it's God explaining yeah. that he is meant to be good and honest and forthright, and it's Weems trying to create an image of America now using America then right. in the in the very early mo yeah. right. moments of the early 19th century, of trying to create Washington as a model for a new America, a model for America's children, and he was enormously successful at it. Um, he angered, by the way, John Marshall, who had published a very studious multi-volume biography of Washington around the same time, and turns out nobody wanted to buy that. Um, <laughs> now, Miranda's not... I, I, out of the territory. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then creating judicial review. You know, it's all in a day's work. <laughs> 
but Miranda is picking up on that sort of tradition that goes back that far. And in the essay, I talk about a little about Howard Zinn, a little about Walt Disney and the portrayals of American history at Disney World. Um, Miranda is carrying on that tradition. Now, I don't want, I want it to be very clear, I am not accusing him of making things up whole cloth. Well, the match meter and the rhyme, and, but he's transparent about that. Um, but he is very self-consciously trying to tell a story that works. Um, Renee, you call it a civic myth, right? That creates this sort of model of America and that in, in so many ways reflects what he thinks we are or should be mm-hmm. as much as it reflects the past. Right. And Renee, you say that he actually manages somehow to appeal to liberals and conservatives? Well, this, this is one of the most amazing things, especially because oftentimes the teaching uh, and the representations of the nation's founding are very politicized and very politically divisive, right? There have been um, for decades, ongoing decades, something that we've called the history wars, which is a battle over how should we teach American history. And it's a battle because the, the sense is how you teach history shapes the national identity, shapes how we conceive of ourselves as a people, shapes how, what, we th- what are our priorities as a country. And one of the most amazing things to me about Hamilton is that it, is, it has appealed to, for the most part, both uh, political f- folks who define themselves as Democrats or political liberals and folks who define themselves as conservatives. So, uh, you know, Barack Obama says this is the only thing Dick Cheney and I ever agreed on, right, was the musical Hamilton. I start my essay in the book talking about in Utah, the, uh, the state legislature there, the most, uh, yeah, the, the founder of Utah progressives, the most progressive member of the Utah legislature, and a member, one of the most far right members of the Utah legislature who wants to make uh, the federal government give back all the lands they have in Utah, um, dressed up as King George and as Hamilton together to get the Utah state legislature to sponsor a resolution honoring Lin-Manuel Miranda and this beautiful musical and all it had done for the country. And to say that when age appropriate, it should be taught in the schools. So to me, that's a real, that's where my essay really, what my essay explores, like how do we explain this and what does that mean that this could be, you know, both the nation and the National Review are giving this musical positive reviews, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's really a, a hard thing to do. And so part of the genius, and I think it also relates to the popularity when, you know, for me, why is this so popular, is that when you're teaching in American history, right, and you're trying to create a, an origin story for the nation, the origin stories we have tend to be celebratory. Most of you know, this is true of all nations, right? This is what makes us great. This is what makes us who we are. Here is this myth of uh, social mobility, the self-made man, all that stuff. Um, and that leaves out all of the negative stuff, right? It leaves out <laughs> slavery. It leaves out native dispossession. It leaves out all the bad stuff. So what he's managed to do, I think, is to offer a vision of an inclusive America that's still celebratory, right? And that's a really hard spot to hit, one that's saying we value uh, blacks and Latinos, right? Like, everything, like we want to create this inclusive picture. Women are, are out there and inclusive. Like it's all this positive vision. Immigrants are great, right? Immigrants, we get the job done while not undermining those, that, that, the traditional celebratory narrative that has been... Uh, really held on to tightly by by folks on the right as like necessary for a sense of national unity. Right. Right. And I would say that um, Patricia Edera's um, No mm-hmm. Relation, uh, her essay in the book talks a lot about that, maneuvering that as a parent and mm-hmm. with uh, with uh, just sort of the question of like how to right. like when her kids who are kids of color you know who are, uh, are are falling in love with this musical, but then she's aware of the erasures and the silences. Mm-hmm. And, and so that sort of space of reckoning, but also a space of activating a sense of this is part of a tradition. We're in. It's, it's walking that very powerful line right. that um, I think you're right to say that there's something about it. It's, I think that's another way of that. What I was saying is it's doing two, always doing a couple things at once, and that has permitted surprising synergies. Yeah. Right. And Brian, you've, you're kind of getting close to this, but um, maybe you could talk about why or whether you think the musical really is as revolutionary as we keep saying it is. Well, uh, I don't. I mean, what, what, well, I think it's. Um, I think it's remarkably conventional in a lot. Like it, you can take a, take a lot of approaches to it in a lot of ways. I do think it's precedent setting in a certain way. I think it's the. I think uh, the American theater uh, is a sort of before Hamilton and an after Hamilton moment. It's a benchmark moment. It's one of these kind of moments of like. There's a lot of things that are now like okay, you've done like. Uh, the idea of what sometimes is called non-traditional or inclusive casting 
It's like, well, they took it about as far as they can go, uh, <laughs> and it didn't solve all the problems. So what you got next? You know, it sort of, it sort of is 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 creating a bar of just sort of say, okay, here's a musical that centers performers of color, most of whom are not marquee names, and it's a blockbuster. It does a few things that are sort of. Uh, so I think it it has had some industrial impact. I think it's also. I think for me, uh, like believe me, theater historians have a very contentious relationship with the piece, much like early American, early Americanists. And I keep saying to my colleagues, I say, we're going to have to reckon with this for a long time. Mm. The moment of Hamilton will pass, but its legacy and its imprint on our students, just like a lot of my literature colleagues who teach literature, have to reckon with Harry Potter. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a kind of thing where it's a kind of inaugural moment of sort of what does it mean to encounter live performance, even if it's an approximation by various mediation things. So I think it's, it is, and it's also impactful in that I don't, even though our colleague Elizabeth Wallman talks a lot about the... Um, in the book, she has a great piece about the hot ticket and a great piece about the sort of the musicals that gathered broad popular attention. This is a very 21st century version of that story. And it is one of the, like how often have, like first off, how often has theater historians been invited to sit on the stage at the National Archive to have a conversation about American history? It's true. This is why it's precedent setting, because in some ways it has put something that emerged from theater at various centers of the conversation. My essay opens talking about how Lin-Manuel Miranda, when he hosted Saturday Night Live, was the very first time that anybody had hosted that show with their success only existing on Broadway, because at that point he had nothing else going. He was not known for anything else, and he makes a joke about that. Like This is this moment of a kind of cultural, uh, the rare moment when theater in the last 100 years has been sort of, in, like at least since the 50s, sort of something that folks would be talking about as a referent cultural text. And so this is where I think that, the, and it does open up again, the ways in which live performance informs people's lives. Because again, like as I've said in many times, is many of us, I saw, I had the good fortune because I was sort of in, in the loop. I saw Hamilton three times in the first year it was out. I saw, I saw the first three King Georges. I saw the only straight King George, Brian Darcy James, as a public. The only time a straight man played it, where the feigness played a very different register than the openly gay performers that followed. I have not been able to get a ticket since, and I have not seen it in any other city. Um, but I have a feel, and I suspect that the next time I see it will be when a high school or a middle school down the road performs mm. it. Because the licensing plan, as it's been announced, this may change, is that they're going to release the, license, the amateur licenses to schools before they release the professional and semi-professional rights. So, so, so schools <laughs> will have access to doing this show. And there's, there's rumor, uh, early, early indications suggested that there may be a version of the licensed version of the show that will allow gender crossing on all the roles, not just. So there might be, so, so we might have a different lens. And so what, what, we'll, what we get with that is this sort of experiential encounter, which is the live performance experience. We get this experiential encounter that is often really, there's so many young people who are having this kind of electric, passionate, love and now hate relationship with Hamilton. And so I think with the musical. So I think it's going to have a ripple effect in different ways. And I can't point to any other, even if we look back to something like South Pacific or Hair, I can't point to another, another theatrical text that's going to have the multi-site impact for as long as this one will. That's the only place I would say it's revolutionary. Right, right. Uh, Michael, the musical saved Hamilton on the $10 bill, is that right? What's that? The, the, the musical kept oh, Hamilton yeah. on the well, $10 Miranda bill? Miranda was in favor of getting, uh, well, putting, they we're going to put Harriet Tubman on the 20 I don't know where that is now, actually. I don't know if that's still don't going look at forward. me. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't been able to find out. Yeah. Um, it redeemed him as, he's, he's in trouble with libertarians, and if you're a free market person or a libertarian, Hamilton is your least favorite founding father. <laughs> And uh, so where I teach at George Mason, the whole econ department is throwing darts at pictures of Hamilton. He's the devil. Uh, and Jefferson is your hero because he doesn't want banks and he doesn't want centralized government. And Hamilton is, he has a really, um, it's fascinating to read his writing on money because he doesn't believe in anything. It's actually, it's really, it's both repellent and noble. He, he doesn't, um, he doesn't. <laughs> He doesn't have any uh, illusions. He says when in his notes on, he, he figures out what a dollar should be. He defines it. It's this much silver and this much gold. He, he lays it out. And he says at one point, well, we have to have a gold standard. He said, I don't know why people care about gold. I don't know why people think that it's valuable, but they do. 
so we have to go with it. And that's very typical Hamilton. Like uh, other people are falling on their sword over the necessity of a gold standard then and now. And he just doesn't care about that. He, calls, he cares about what can work and mm -hmm. what can be made to work. And the film really captures his pragmatism. I mean, no, the, the play really captures his pragmatism, which is really probably the most admirable thing about him is his pragmatism. <laughs> he's not an ideologue, and Jefferson is. And is, he's a creep, right, in a lot of ways. Jefferson is really creepy. And Hamilton has his flaws, but he's not an ideologue. And that's part of what makes him hated, I think. Hmm. He's, not, he's not willing to you know, stand for something very stable. And when he talks about money, he talks about it as something of an illusion, but an illusion we have to maintain. But if you want to praise him, which I do, you'd say he also talks about racial prejudice as an illusion. He says, our prejudice against the blacks is mostly imaginary, right? And if we change our thinking, we can change the way we look at them. That's a fairly powerful statement for someone of his day. I have a question for Claire, but then maybe we'll see if you all have questions. And there are microphones Sorry, in the aisles on the side, so if you could make your way there, we'll see what you would like to ask the panel. Um, would the founding fathers have resorted to Twitter? <laughs> oh, oh I think Hamilton would have loved yeah. Twitter. Yeah. I really do. I mean, one of the things I think about a lot, I'm actually writing a book um, about social media and politics um, in, in the last several decades. And um, one of the things that I think both blogs and Twitter and Facebook remind me of a lot is pamphleteering, mm -hmm. yeah. um, the kinds of insults that were traded in, in pubs um, and, and coffee houses and so on. I mean, I think the robust and sometimes very destructive culture of Twitter, you know, really kind of harkens back to that, you know, moments when people were fighting duels with each other over ideas. And also you the know? false personas, like writing yeah. as a, you know, yes. a federal farmer yeah. or yeah. Tacitus or something. What's like that. actually yeah. really funny, my, my chapter is actually about social media and fan communities on social media, is depending on whether you track these things or not, there are accounts on social media that, you know, are Alexander Hamilton accounts and Aaron Burr accounts and so on. And when they find each other, they engage with each other. So there, there is a kind of play on Twitter that attempts to sort of recreate this, this world. Yeah. I just got through the Chernow biography. And one of the things that really came out of the book to me is the hostility yeah. of, the, of the political discourse of the day. Yeah. Yeah. And I took a step back. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I calmed down now and thought we're not at the edge of the world exactly, yeah. for, right. for maybe for the first time. Right. Anyway. Well, I think it points in the 1790s to the fragility of the idea of a republic. That they, uh, sure. I mean, their political theory about republics is that they all fail pretty rapidly. And so every debate and every fight became existential mm -hmm. of is a criticism of the government, is a criticism of the governors a criticism of the underlying system of government. And so there's, yeah, there's an edge and a depth to the, the, the battles that yeah. we don't have quite today. I also think the anonymity, you mm -hmm. know, that, that, you know, people often made um, their arguments anonymously, um, sometimes to protect themselves, but sometimes to make those arguments seem um, you know, more elevated and less personal and so on. And, and of course, the anonymity of social media is, you know, possibly one of the features we see more destructive today because people mm -hmm. don't take ownership of their ideas. Um, but I think, you know, had the founding fathers been able to just have these arguments on Twitter, oh, I think they would have loved it. <laughs> <laughs> tweet, tweet. Do you see Jefferson? <laughs> <laughs> I can see Hamilton nonstop. Yeah. Yes. So, so with the disclaimer that Dr. O'Malley taught me about Jackson uh, in grad school, um, the thing that strikes me that you haven't talked about, although you've, you've talked about central government and central banking, the, these folks are anti-democratic in some sense, right? Washington and Hamilton are the guys on the horses putting down the Whiskey Rebellion. So here's a story about American democracy and all of these people coming together to make this story happen. When we know these guys are afraid of the mob, right? right? They're really not crazy about some of the things and the ideas that are happening. And so the Schuyler sisters are thinking this is a great idea, but Schuyler himself, right, probably not crazy about the idea of upward mobility and things like yeah. that. So <laughs> how do we think about the political aspects of democracy and anti-democratic or, or centralized kinds of ideas when you're trying to, to change the casting, to change the idea of the revolution, 
at the same time dealing with the historical truths of some of what these guys got up to. It's really interesting. To, it is really interesting to make Miranda be Hamilton. I mean, it's and the, the line "immigrants we get things done." It's a very moving line, very effective. But it's an extraordinary piece of historical sleight of hand to make yes. Hamilton into a hero of the common people. Like that. That's just <laughs> unbelievable, <laughs> really. Or, or, like, or into an immigrant. Or, or into an immigrant. Really, it's immigrant. like that's it's pure, right pure uh, yeah. artistry. Well, and uh, it's one of the things that bothers me about it. Right. It's it celebrates a moment. I mean, it celebrates. Uh, you're right. It celebrates. A country we which we lived we lived in where racism wasn't so present. Right? I think that's a or a, a country we could be. We could be that we we'd like be, to be. Right? Right? Yeah, a vision it celebrates that really strongly, right. and it does it by celebrating the striving of the ordinary person. Yeah. But right. Hamilton, no. As soon as yeah. he got up, he's going to pull up the ladder. Pretty well, much. and that's where I think <laughs> yeah. that's where I think that Miranda's work is. If Miranda's an ideologue, it's uh, it's upward mobility. Uh, uh, sort of uh, bootstrapping upward right. mobility, like the right. sort of that the American dream is possible through hard work and scrappiness. Right. You At know, least in and, New York City. And, and yeah, well, in I think in both. Well, but I'm just reading across his work too. Yeah. Right. Like this is sort yes. of a core, a core moral value, and also a core moral value of his parents' political act, his uh, p the political ideology in which he was raised. So I do think that if we were to sort of read events, there is sort of a moral clarity that is very late 20th century that is very different than the historical story being told. If I can just respond to the, on the Im question of immigrants, I think actually there's more of a question of whether Miranda's an immigrant than whether Hamilton was considered an immigrant in the 18th century. Um, right, well, the political question of whether a Puerto Rican is an immigrant is not, is, has, is a debate today. I think Hamilton, as somebody from the islands, was treated very much, and that is him, that is Miranda reproducing language that's from the 18th century. Um, of him as a Creole, of him as as variety of derogatory terms used against him by Adams and others, um, was that his islandness was treated as otherness. Right, mm -hmm. but I think the the critique, and this is you know that comes out elsewhere in the book, is the idea that a British subject moving from one part of the British Empire to another part of the British Empire is not the same as the kind of framework of immigration we think about today. Right, mm -hmm. so you know it's it's not the the same process, though I. You, you know, I agree com yeah, completely that yeah. his Caribbean background is used as a, a cudgel against him, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Let's go over here. Hi, um, I'm Nancy Spanis. I'm, um, I've written a review of your book. Uh, Thank you. I miss Potter, <laughs> Miss Potter, uh, <laughs> and I have corresponded. Uh, I'm a member of the Alexander Hamilton AHA Society. Um, <laughs> I've <laughs> uh, written a book on the political economy of the American Revolution heavily based on Hamilton, and um, believe in the great man theory of history, <laughs> let me say. Um, the, uh, I had actually found Professor O'Malley's uh, contribution in the book uh, much more pleasing to me than what he's saying tonight. Uh, but Somebody the, has to be the curmudgeon. Uh, we have one every panel. <laughs> uh, particularly the fact that what we was done with the currency was to go from states where you had an imprimatur of these 13 states to the nation, and the first currency that had Hamilton on it was under Abraham Lincoln. And in fact, you could make a lot of comparisons to the thinking of Alexander Hamilton and Abraham Lincoln, and there is a genealogy there. Mm -hmm. Because I totally disagree that Alexander Hamilton was not for the common man because there would be no United States to have existed to defend the Consti to defend the Declaration of Independence and our rights if the Constitution had not been founded. Alexander Hamilton did a major contribution to having a constitutional convention, to passing the Constitution, and then to establishing a nation. That was the purpose of the money system, establish one nation that could defend itself against the European powers. So um, I would really appreciate if people wanted to go to americansystemnow.com, my blog. Um, but even if you didn't, um, please think about it. This guy did build this country. Yes, there were problems with his personal life. Don't try to get me to agree with everything he did. Uh, but the uh, critique from the standpoint of, of him being an elitist, I find very problematic, having read everything 
and looked at the effect of his vision for a country that would, could stand up, could industrialize, could improve the living standard for all people uh, in this country. Thank you. Yeah. He is a tough one to untangle. Did you want to reply? No, he and, certainly and, and has. He shares Smith's vision of a nation and how a national economy should function. Just, you know, the bank, neither, the bank doesn't last very long. I mean, people can't wait to get rid of it. He's not his, and the charge against him is elitism. I don't know that, I, I don't disagree with you about his, the centrality of nation and his vision and the centrality of the money system, the nation building. I completely agree with you. But the rhetoric of the Jacksonians is all about how he's crushing the ordinary person with his, with his vindictive monster bank. Right, or to, uh, I could go, I'm going to stop. <laughs> but don't get me started. <laughs> Is this on? Okay, cool. Sorry, I broke it. Okay, hi, my name is Zara. I go to the University of Florida and I'm studying journalism. And as a writer, something I really admire about Alexander Hamilton is his ability to write. Uh, not only that, but his persistence. And one of the things that they mention in um, the musical, Aaron Burr says, um, his enemies think that, they're, that he's defeated, and he says, as long as he holds a pen, he's a threat. And my question is to you, what do you think made him so powerful, and what do you think um, they were so threatened by with just his ability to have a pen and a paper, and he could still destroy them if he wanted to, um, and get the country going in his direction? He was a vicious and prolific writer. <laughs> um, and there's, there's one line in the, the Ad administration sit down, John, and I can't repeat the rest because this is a family show and it's on YouTube. Um, and Miranda has a longer version of that, a, a minute-long version of that, that letter. It's vicious, um, the things he wrote about Adams in the, the letter that he wrote in, in that particular instance. Um, he wrote 50 of the Federalist essays in half, half a dozen months, in six months. Um, I think his prolificness and his willingness to to wield a pen publicly is something that, and there's, there's space to fill up in those newspapers. Right. Mm. And that's honestly one of my favorite things about the musical is the way it captures, like, and makes his writing dramatic, right? Usually sitting, someone sitting there writing is not the highest form of drama, right? But, like, the, right, the way that he's, they capture him in all these scenes where he's writing is at the desk and the, the song about I wrote my way out and the yeah. power of rhetoric. Right, I mean, he's a master at you know, writing these, this prose that can persuade people, right? And the power of rhetoric to be persuasive, uh, the, the play really communicates that, that that was one of his, his greatest powers, right? And it allowed him to climb in the way that he did. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I actually think it's worth remembering how powerful writing is. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when um, after, after the election in 2016, um, Renee and I were both pretty distraught um, as, as a number of people were. And Renee, you know, we had a conversation about the book that we were supposed to have, and Renee said, what is the point? I mean, what, <laughs> why are we even doing this? The whole country is burning down around our ears. And I was like, pull yourself together, you know? If Hamilton were here at this moment, he would start writing again, you know? And, and I think, somebody. Right. Yeah. Oh, you know, I do. I do think the power of writing, I mean, historians believe that everything is very specific to its period, but looking at the role that writing plays in whatever format, whether it's, whether it's writing on social media, whether it's writing pamphlets, whether it's writing zines, you know, it, it, there is a power to that um, in every single period. I would also add that we think politics are rough and tumble today you should have lived in the 18th and early 19th century. And, you know, I was talking to Joanne Freeman, one of our authors about this, and she said, you know, it was after the whole thing about the Russian hacking and so on, and she said, you know, in early America, sometimes they would send a messenger in the middle of an election, which actually took weeks to have elections because you had to collect the ballots and get them counted and so on. Sometimes they would send a messenger to a town and say, you know, no, no point voting for X, he died, <laughs> you know? And <laughs> such a good thing. Right, so, so you know, the, the, the ways in which, you know, Hamilton being able to write viciously um, was, was part of his appeal as a politician. And I, so, would, I would just want to add that I think that one of the things that's really worth noting is that one of the ways that Miranda, that Lin-Manuel Miranda has broken template 
is he's continued to write uh, in ways that he wasn't always being compensated for. Like, like if you're following the Hamel drops, like all this sort of the new material that's coming out, the fact that he was engaged so much as Claire depicts, uh, like does on social media, like this idea of Manuel uh, the Miranda himself is always constantly writing in a variety of idioms, both official and unofficial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so sort of exemplifying that while also enacting it on stage. So sort of capturing the zeal of creativity <laughs> in the face of all kinds of challenge. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, so I think there's something else that's really activated about the force of creativity there. And there's something about the moment. I mean, you could, you could argue he's a great writer, which Hamilton's a great writer, which he is. But he also distills ideas that are circulating in England and continentally, right? right? Everybody yeah. says this. It's, it's a moment when these eyes are, these ideas are really ripe. And he plucks them out. He doesn't pluck them out of the air. They're all around him, and he distills them really well. And I think Miranda does that, too. Yeah. Right? You could feel this. I think that's what he saw in Hamilton. And you can see it in the, in the writing of the, of the play. Right. OK. Interesting to hear that the experience in New York was a Hamilton Jefferson experience. Mm -hmm. For me, seeing it here, it was a story about Aaron Burr, so mm -hmm. much so mm -hmm. that I went to, to, um, to Gore Vidal's yeah, book to read. Right. To read. <laughs> um, but my question is about um, whether Miranda is, has been, whether he emulated Shakespeare's approach in terms of taking histories rewriting them for the audience of his day, mm -hmm. using the language of his audience, mm -hmm. um, and making it very accessible. Well, that's, that's the, um, I, I do think that, yes, and I think uh, uh, Oscar Eustace, who's the artistic director of the public, is, is sort of, has a lot of quotes where he's talking about that's precisely what he sees and why he, why he chose to champion. Uh, Hamilton, in certain ways, is writing a uh, writing uh, in that that long tradition, and also that tradition of the of having the narrative arc of the show be anchored by not the like the hero. If we think of place, uh, if we think of stories like um, let's say Amadeus, for example, the Peter Schaffer play, which is really about Salieri, yeah. and it's all anchored by Salieri, but the famous one is Amadeus. And so this, they play that duality, they play that duo thing. And I do think it's, if you were to sort of look at it in terms of conventional dramaturgy, it's, if it's anybody's story, it's actually Burr's story. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, that's where the sort of the more traditional dramaturgical arc is. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's the question though of who, who, of who lives, who dies, who tells your story, and who emerges in what way in memory. But I think you're, at, you're nailing it in, in terms of just both discerning what, what's at work, what is sort of, there is a long tradition even in the 20th century. I, I glanced, I touched on this a little bit in my essay about like the way presidential history is engaged on the stage is about really sort of asking these questions of the contemporary moment always. And um, so, uh, so, but you, I think you've really nailed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi, Clara Sachs. I am a theater grad and a DC licensed tourist guide. <laughs> From the revolutionary point of view of theater, for me, it takes me back to Godspell and Jesus Christ Superstar and how that opened up a discussion for Christianity, for young people, the way this has opened up history. As a DC tourist guide, it has completely changed how eighth graders, tens of thousands of them, come to Washington every March and June. And they came over a year ago already knowing the lyrics by heart. And guides had to play catch up yeah. and learn about this <laughs> Hamilton musical thing. And it's become the way that we can bring them in to what had previously been all these memorials about dead white men. Mm -hmm. um, and I just had, a, and even beyond the national, the international, I just had a family of five from Australia yesterday who today are in New York and day one in New York, they're seeing Hamilton. Mm -hmm. They have flown from Australia to here and they're seeing Hamilton and I have a, a family from Canada coming in next week and they already know that the dueling pistols are gone from the Postal Museum exhibit. Mm -hmm. So for us here in D.C. in the tourism industry, it's, it's just really, we've had to catch up. We've had to catch up it, and we're still trying, but it's, it's incredible how it's opened the door for youth. It's wonderful, it's wonderful. Well, and, and one of the things that we talk about in the book, and one of the essays is by a high school teacher 
who talks about, you know, he came into his homeroom and he found his, you know, students singing songs from Hamilton and he's like, oh my Lord, like, you know, we don't usually, the students and I don't usually like always meet in the middle in terms of what we're, we think is cool, right? <laughs> um, so it, it became such an entry point. He's like, I'm gonna develop a whole course around this and it'll be about using the musical to learn early American history, right? And a lot of teachers are doing that and we see there's, uh, there's granting agencies that are giving money to schools to take, kids, uh, particularly from disadvantaged schools in New York, to go see Hamilton. It's become a big educational initiative. And I think one of the, um, one of the, the things that sometimes we lose in the conversation in talking about it is there's the representation itself that, you know, as we've talked about, has you know, any number of strengths and problems. But it then t t leads a lot of people to go further, yeah. right? It leads a lot of people to say, I mean, my 13, then 13-year-old, 13 when they said, you know, oh, bring a book for the car ride, he's like, okay. And he went and got Ron Chernow's biography. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not that long a car ride, you know? But that's what he wanted to read, right? Because he loved Hamilton. There's a surging boom in publishing in middle grade and young adult fiction, sort of right. offshoot characters or other scenarios adjacent. So right. it's... So well, it's like bringing people in so they'll ask further questions. Yeah. And I'm like, anything that makes people want to read the Federalist Papers? Like, yeah. you know, I mean, that's Brent like- Brent Kavanaugh was writing. asked in his hearings, which are your favorite Federalist Papers? And I know what they are. And I'm in the car writing which numbers it is. <laughs> I gotta go read those. <laughs> gotta go read those. Right. It's fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, I have downloaded the Federalist Papers. Haven't read them yet, but I wasn't, I wasn't there a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> your next car ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, and the, but the, the troublesome thing about reading the biography after seeing the show is that you read the biography with songs in your head, yeah. right. which is plus right. minus. <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, my name is, okay. can you hear me? Yes. Or, yeah. Okay, my name is Faith. Um, I, my question is kind of about the blending of history and art. Mm. Obviously, Hamilton has changed the way that the public consumes history. So where do you see kind of historians and theater or other kinds of art kind of picking up from that to, um, you know, History is really important. My husband's a history major. You know, I minored in history in college. Uh, but how do you how do you see the future of history and art kind of coming together to maybe? Uh, as I think one of you mentioned earlier, form like a more civic like a civic community around mm -hmm. like an agreement on what we can say is historically true and historically not true. Mm. Well, I, I mean, I think it, your question obliquely sort of goes back to the question that was asked about Shakespeare. Um, I think one of, the, one of the functions Hamilton plays is it makes a world that is very, very long ago seem accessible to people. You know, Renee and I teach 20th century American history. We never have any trouble filling our classes. And, and early Americanists often struggle against this thing of students feeling like that's such a long ago past that there's nothing they can identify with it. So I do think Historians, academic historians, may want to think about the lessons of Hamilton. How do we produce um, art, produce mashups, produce stuff on social media that actually reaches out to audiences and beckons them and says, you know, we're inviting you to come and talk to us about this. Um, and, and Hamilton has created that space, not just for teachers and students, but for parents and children, um, for fans and academics, um, and so on. And whatever its flaws, a space where people can take pleasure and talk to each other as equals is a space where the work of history is going to be advanced. And if I can just... So, oh, um, I would just say that one of the things, and I, this is to beat the drum again, is uh, if you look at most, off, most seasons of most theater, uh, th theater companies uh, in this town or any town you're in, there are gonna be plays, new plays, that are reckoning with the American history or the global history. The history is part of what theater is, and part of what theater is is making worlds that are not present in the contemporary, in the moment we are sharing in this space and time right now, making them come to life, making them, making them real again so we can reckon with them in a new and different way. The thing that Hamilton did is it brought other eyes to what theater does and making the past come, become awake and become alive, and so if, if I wish that more historians would sort of talk, look and see what the theater is doing, even if it's not the runaway status symbol <laughs> project of Hamilton. You know, that's the piece that I feel I'm disappointing about this, is I don't see necessarily that more historians are more interested in theater, they're just more interested in Hamilton. And that, that, is, the, that is the separation of the possibility of, 
I mean, I think in museum work and in uh, theater work, most cultural institutions are thinking, reckoning very seriously with what does the past mean in the contemporary moment. And it's sometimes trying to bridge the disciplinary divides that still persist. Mm -hmm. I have a, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, uh, uh, so I would say to build on Claire's comment that it's, build, it's tapping in for historians into larger conversations and fights that we are having about the forms of writing and the forms of, I mean, every conference I go to has a plenary session on mm -hmm. narrative history or biography or some other, what with inside the profession we would call an alternate form of, of writing about the past. Um, and it's opened up and tapped into conversations about the kind of assignments we give in our classrooms. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the trend didn't start with Hamilton, but things, something called the unessay, which is essentially a creative, if Lynn Memoranda was in my class and turned in cabinet Battle number one, as an unessay, he'd be doing pretty well. <laughs> um, but that of of giving assignments that ask students to think about the past in these like that, and it's, I think, helping open the door to see that it's possible to do it and do it in a way that's successful, and to do it in a way my colleagues are going to kill me for saying this, but that is relatively sensitive to the history of the revolution in the early republic and and what's going on there and. Mm -hmm. Mike. I have a friend who says that the best historical film ever made is Blazing Saddles. And, <laughs> and, and, and I think it's a good point because the film doesn't pretend to be real. Yeah. It subverts historical expectations without pretending to tell you the real thing or without pretending to give you historical accuracy. It opens the door to rethinking uh, stereotypes. And that makes it a fairly powerful film and it, it, as a piece of historical thinking. And I think that the part that would trouble me about Hamilton is where... I would want to see history integrate with art, but I don't want to see it reproduce the present in costume. And uh, that would be, I would want to keep art and history a little bit at arm's length, maybe. Mm -hmm. But I think asking questions about the past is something that theater does all the time. And the historians don't often look to the way that that's, like, that's and, it, and, 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 it's, and it's this question of, like, what is the project of history? Is the project of history about asking questions about the past? Then where are the other sides? Hamilton has shown that there's a lot of folks that are interested in asking questions about the past from the contemporary moment. That's right. where we are. That's right. we, we have to be at the moment we are. And mm -hmm. theater is a space that has that duality of both then and now, uh, like the, the world on the stage and the world that we share in space and time together. And so I think it's, uh, as a way of asking about the past, I think there's a lot of very interesting writers uh, on the American stage right now who are asking questions about the past that are not uh, they're, they're, not, they're not having commercial success, I mean, in the same way, because I think part of what amplified this commercial success is because it's very to the contemporary taste. Right. Yes. I desperately hope that I'm not going too far out of scope. Um, Lin-Manuel Miranda, after Hamilton had already become successful, decided to go on to Comedy Central's Drunk History mm -hmm. and oh, yeah. retell the story there as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you could comment on the nature of that program as a as a <laughs> additional an additional yeah, no, like good. way yeah. to expand this story yeah. and also <laughs> tell this tell any story of history to bring people into the discussion. So just in case folks don't know or aren't, don't know this show Drunk History, so it has a it, somewhat self-explanatory. It, 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 yeah. it, it, it has a some, usually a non-historian. Yeah. Uh, gets to sort of usually has some coaching on a historical story, and then they're asked to retell that story as they get increased, as they finish a, a, a really shocking amount of alcohol. <laughs> and so, so it's basically they're not speaking from their historical knowledge necessarily. They've been coached, they've been practicing the story, but then they try to retell that story. So it is a sort of a thing of how do we tell the stories of the past. Um, and in this case, and in, and in Miranda's case, he actually had a deep, originally, gen, like his own, his own sort of, he was sort of a geek for the story he was telling. That's sometimes the case, not always the case. But yes, that's, the, that's what we're talking about here. And I think one of the, one of the I love drunk, drunk History as a, as a show. As a show. Yeah, I was just going to tease. <laughs> I was going to tease. Please. It's not um, been a, an exam you know, choice in your class yet. No. Oh, no. <laughs> um, dry campus. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think what it speaks to, and it's one of the questions that I think historians fight about with Hamilton, too, is a question that we have a, as a premise is our our not historians, our audience is walking in and assuming that what they're seeing is history with a capital H. Is it a true and accurate representation of the past? And if your answer to that question is, yes, I do think audiences are doing that, then I think historians tend to have more 
trouble with it, and I don't know if that's where your curmudgeonly comes from. Um, if you don't assume, well, which is, but it, well, <laughs> but if you don't necessarily assume that, if you assume someone turns on drunk history and they're going to get a story, I mean, the, the Ben Franklin flying the kite one is great as a story. Is it exactly historically accurate? Um, is the Hamilton one, or eh, are are any of them? Well, but if you assume that people are going and going, this is a fun story, and it's kind of true, but it's also, it's a comic who's drinking an insane amount of whiskey while he's telling this story. As an entry point into history, then yeah, it's fantastic and great and, and hilarious sometimes. And, and they sometimes, in drunk history, as in Hamilton, get at things through art that we can't in the way that we write professional mm -hmm. history mm -hmm. today. Well, and I personally like the Harriet Tubman one. That's my favorite. But, but I would also say, and I write about this in my chapter, historians were some of the first academics to really take to digital spaces. And so I think both digital space as a place to do serious historical work, um, the um, Center for New Media and History something, New something Media. Up, Media. up at CUNY. Oh, okay. uh, you know, they, they did the first, the American Social History Project, they did the, one of the first big social history textbooks that had digital supplements um, so that students could actually work with primary documents and images at the same time as reading a textbook. The Roy Rosenzweig Center at George Mason has done a tremendous amount of work in terms of how you put history in digital spaces in ways that, that are interactive, in ways that allow us to get more out of text. Um, I, I think digital spaces um, as a place where people sort of routinely go for history should not be ignored. Wikipedia, you know. <laughs> so, so drunk history is but one piece of it. Um, but I also think digital spaces encourage other people to do history. I mean, if you go through, you can Google anything, and you'll see all of these history projects that kids and college students and so on have done on YouTube or done on websites and, and so on. So I actually think the digital space is inspirational for history. Mm -hmm. We have time for one last question, and then our panelists will be outside uh, with, with, with the book. I know one of, the, one of the criticisms of Hamilton has been, you know, that it's not exactly accurate, but as the professor said, in two and a half hours, he crammed in a lot of words. And, uh, but are you aware that the, the Hamilton Enterprise is creating an exhibit, and I know they have, it's under the leadership of the Chicago. top Washington, or Ham, uh, Jeffersonian and Hamiltonian experts, that's going to be traveling around, but starting in Chicago. Yeah. Have you been yeah. involved in that at all, or because no? that's going to like tell all the history, the real history? No, we're we're the rogue Hamiltonians. Yeah, um, yeah we're, we're, <laughs> we did our best to actually make contact with Hamilton Inc., and they weren't having any of it. No. But but <laughs> we tried to get tickets to the show for all the authors saying that this was like we needed review tickets. And they did not buy that story. But no. I would say, you know, this is not the first enterprise, really. The the, the big Hamilton exhibit at um, the New York Historical Society, yeah. um, which a couple of our authors were involved with, preceded the show. Um, and then uh, Miranda's um, association with Gilder Lehrman and the New York Historical Society mm -hmm. pioneered a whole set of programs that not only brings students to the show, mm -hmm. but takes them to the New York Historical Society and other places and so on. So I think the traveling exhibit is sort of the more popular piece of it. There's another whole piece of it that, that Miranda has basically financed um, with, you know, in partnership with Gilder Lehrman that really is about trying to take the energy of the excitement of, about Hamilton and loop it back in to teach young students who often in public schools don't have great access to the kind of history we would like them to have in part because of the testing regimen and so on, to, to get them acquainted with primary documents and what does it mean to actually 
do the serious work of historical research. And part of the, part of the work that uh, has emerged from that has been in many of the uh, school shows on, uh, that happen in New York, they'll often have students who have developed songs or monologues or raps or whatever about, historic, about primary documents and they'll feature them on stage. And mm -hmm. so, so it is sort of pro playing with that, uh, that un-essay approach of mm -hmm. just like, what is your way into history? Like, how do we think about history using the things you love thinking with your creativity? Mm -hmm. And last thing, very briefly, Renee, did you want to say something about what made you guys put this volume together and, and what you think the project really was? <laughs> yeah, I, so I think the thing that really uh, got me to put this project together, I live in um, uh, central Ohio, so a very homogenous uh, area, it's not completely by choice. Um, also, you know, central Ohio, a quite politically conservative uh, area, and I was walking down the street, and there's a group of teenagers walking down the street, and they were all singing Hamilton at the top of their lungs. And I thought this is, you know, this, this musical has truly reached beyond the Broadway bubble. Like we, you know, and, and, and Brian talks about the Broadway bubble in his essay, but like we are really far outside the Broadway bubble here, <laughs> right, that these kids are singing Hamilton. And that made me, you know, felt like this is a project that we really need to explore what this musical's doing, um, what it means to people, why it's so popular, and what we can learn by, uh, by engaging with it from a variety of perspectives. Right. Well, it's an engaging volume. The authors will be outside with it. Thank you for being here. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.